Welcome to the Yadi Virtual Dialogue. This today's topic is towards a well-being economics, how and why we need to do economics differently, with Professor Nikki Powell and Dr. Hannington Adame as a discussant. And never has there been a more pressing time for this conversation. So on behalf of Yadi, we are delighted to be to be having you here today, Nikki, for this discussion. Some of you may be new to IADI, so I'll tell you a little bit about it. It stands for the European Association of Development Research and Training Institutes. And IADI is a Europe-wide network of researchers and students in all fields of development. And it promotes the exchange of information among members to strengthen networks and influence development decision makers. Uh, Nikki has a substantial amount of experience in working with policymakers, so we're really pleased to have her here talking about um, such a relevant and pertinent topic on behalf of IADI. So before going into the webinar, some technical points. Dr. Powell will present some of the key concepts of her work on wellbeing economics for about 20 minutes. And then Dr. Hannington Odame will tell us a little bit about the perspectives of why this is needed and some examples from Kenya. And then at the end of both of their presentations, we'll have time for comments and discussions from you in the audience. So on to our speakers, we have Nikki Powell, Associate Professor in Economics of Wellbeing at the Amsterdam Institute for Social Science Research. She is a development economist with over 25 years of research experience in international development studies, mainly in sub-Saharan Africa. And her international research projects involve a lot of collaboration, as I mentioned, with local governors, ministries, NGOs, civil society organizations, and, and a lot of other key stakeholders, some of which she will talk about today around her new book on wellbeing economics. We're also joined by Dr. Hannington Adame, the executive director of the Kenyan-based Center for African Bioentrepreneurship, CABE. And there he leads on initiatives on capacity building of smallholder farmers and youth agripreneurs and facilitates their links to information, to markets and policies. He's the regional coordinator of agricultural policy research in Africa and will be bringing lots of those perspectives on what wellbeing economics means in that context. So that's enough from me. I'm now going to hand over to Nikki for the next 20 minutes. Thank you very much, Rowena, for that introduction. And first of all, I would like to welcome everybody and thank Ayadi for giving me this platform and my new book today. Wellbeing Economics is the title of my book, and the subtitle is How and Why Economics Needs to Change. I think it needs to change, even though I'm an economist myself. And as Rowena said, this is a timely moment. And I think we need to make use of this momentum to push for a new narrative, a new discourse, framework, and methodology of economics. The COVID-19 crisis, similarly to the earlier crisis we have witnessed, has laid bare some of the weaknesses and risks of a neoliberal market-based system. And I feel that in the current intersection of processes of globalization, climate change, and living in the Anthropocene, we really need to rethink the economy beyond GDP growth in order to find more sustainable and inclusive pathways at the levels. At the level of discourse, I think we need a narrative about what the economy is all about and how we would like it to function. Related to that, we also need a new analytical framework, which allows us to take a more comprehensive perspective to what the economy is all about. And of course, related to that, we also need to revisit economic methodology, methods and indicators that are used for measuring key indicators in the economy and for evaluating how the economy is performing. There are of course a lot of proposals out there and they have inspired me in this book and i built further upon them there is the planetary boundaries proposal by johan rockström and his colleagues there is the donut economy proposal 
that is very popular by Kate Rayward, who builds further on the planetary boundary ideas, but also adds to that a social floor. There are debates around degrowth and the idea of reducing our consumption and production levels in order to transform into a more sustainable yeah, economic model. And there are there is solidarity economy already since the late 1990s, the idea that we uh, the economy should uh, pursue multiple value creation. I think these proposals are all very valuable and I built upon them. They introduce new concepts, new theoretical elements and also methodological innovations. But my question is to what extent do they provide a robust framework? And robustness to economists is very important and needed to convince them to adopt uh, a new narrative and, and framework. Robustness refers to the ability of an economic model to remain valid under different assumptions, parameters and conditions. And economists do not like to give that up. In my book, I propose an alternative framework and I go back to some of the basic concepts that we use in economics. So I also redefine what the economy is all about. I built on the work of Tony Lawson, for example, and Carl Polyani to redefine the economy as an instituted process of resource allocation from two economic agents and nature. I specifically bring in this addition from and to economic agents and nature because in the traditional definition of the economy, the economy is presented as this neutral system of resource allocation where power differences and our interrelations with nature are not defined. Um, Furthermore, I put well-being and not productivity or economic growth at the center of our economic concerns. In my view, economic agents are people that strive for the optimization of well-being instead of the maximization of individual welfare alone. In that sense, I consider economic agency maybe as purposeful but sometimes we also have to recognize people only have bad options. So rationality in that sense is not a very helpful concept, I believe. I go back to the basic principles of economics and I define five axiomatic principles that help me to, to this, design this alternative framework. The economy is, in my perspective, not a closed, controllable system, but an instituted process that is open to influences from outside. It is an open system. It is structured and layered according to temporal principles. And so there are boundaries to, to what economics is all about. We cannot say economics is everything. And there is internal coherence because of the interrelationship and exchanges between economic agents and institutions. And last but not least, the economy is subject to emergent change. I like to picture the economy as being embedded within a political, social, cultural and a natural uh, environment. And this idea of the embedded economy has guided me to design an alternative framework where well-being is put at the center. But what do I mean by well-being? By well-being, I built on the definition that Alistair McGregor uh, has used in his uh, earlier work of 2007, a state of being with others where human needs are met, where one can act meaningfully to pursue one's goals, and where one enjoys a satisfactory quality of life. Now, there are certain elements to this definition that hopefully clarify to you that our perspective on well being has both objective elements and subjective elements. Also, it's not only about living well as an individual, 
well-being is also about living well together and together with nature. For analytical purposes, McGregor, and, and uh, I've, I've had the pleasure to work with him uh, over a couple of years, we distinguish between three dimensions of well-being. There is material well-being, which has a lot of connotations with what economists call welfare. So the material aspects uh, of well-being could include housing, income, um, yeah, other material uh, aspects of living well. Relational well-being, the second dimension, which refers to social capital and our interrelations with nature. And then subjective well-being, which is the subjective assessment of material and relational well-being. And these three are, of course, closely interrelated. People may pursue material well-being at some point in time, but at a later point in time, they may give priority to pursuing relational well-being or feeling very satisfied with uh, what they aim and achieve in life. Or they pursue all uh, two or three dimensions of well-being together. This makes our economic decisions quite complex. And let me explain to that, explain that in, in, in a few minutes. Economic agency, I see, is entangled in multiple life domains. Traditionally, economic agency is only analyzed in terms of the decisions that we make about resources in an economic manner based on uh, cost-benefit analysis, for example. But in my proposal, economic agency is entangled in multiple life domains. So we may make decisions in, in the market. At the same time, this has implications for our economic agency in the household or the roles that we play in the community. This makes economic decisions uh, entangled and complex. Furthermore, economic decisions are characterized by multiple trade-offs because of these multiple domains, but also because well-being is multidimensional. So we make, for example, trade-offs between different aspects and dimensions of well-being. Furthermore, we make trade-offs between individual and collective well-being. So I may pursue well-being at my own individual level, what is good for me, but I may also pursue the well-being of my family or of my neighborhood. And lastly, there is a trade-off between well-being over time. When we make economic decisions, this is related to our past, our present and our future. Lastly, rationality, and I mentioned this already, in terms of maximizing individual gain alone, cannot be assumed. I think rationality in this traditional sense of the word is part of our economic decision making. Of course, we are also uh, selfish and maximizing self-interest, but to be cooperative and uh, sharing is also an aspect of our decision making. And we cannot assume away that part of uh, our economic decision making. The methodological implications of this different uh, view on, on the economy is quite considerate. And this is why in the book I design an alternative framework for analyzing these trade-offs between the social, economic and environmental domains that I see are, are all part of the economy. Economists for a long time have used what they call the social accounting matrix, the SAM, as an intermediate step, an, uh, an analytical framework between, let's say, the narrative about the economy and the economic models. And it is that framework that I propose to replace by what I call the well-being economic matrix, the WAM because I think this is the only way to come to a different approach to designing and using 
economic models in a more pluralistic uh, manner. And this is the framework that I propose in the book and I elaborate upon. There is an entire chapter that discusses the details of this matrix and it would be, go beyond the time I have today to explain this framework in detail. But basically what it does, it lists in columns and rows all economic agents in an economy like it does in a social accounting matrix. But in a social accounting matrix, there is only households, firms, government, and the rest of the world being listed. Whereas I distinguish individuals from households, I add social groups and communities, and I also include our exchanges with nature into the framework. And by doing so, we can analyze the exchange of resources between those different agents and those different domains in the economy. And this is important to make this visual and, and, and uh, bring it to the surface from the start, before we even start to think about how to design a model that captures the origins of economic growth or development, for example. On the diagonal of the scheme, we see the allocation that take, takes place between the different economic agents. And altogether, what is exchanged and generated in the economy aggregates into collective well-being. The idea of the, of the matrix is that the matrix is multidimensional itself. And it can also be applied at uh, different levels of aggregation in the economy. That is what I want to say about it now. If you want to learn more about it, I would advise you to read chapter five in the book. So the, there are certain differences between this matrix and the social accounting matrix. Uh, and I've mentioned them in terms of the other economic agents that are included and in nature, but also the notion that well-being doesn't aggregate in the same way as economic growth would do or economic productivity, because we cannot sum up well-being because it's a multidimensional concept. So that is why in the scheme I use the mathematical sign of an intersection, which is this little bow, uh, to make it clear that we cannot simply add up. The diagonal in the WAM is always filled to analyze access and allocation differences within categories a priori, so between households or between firms or between natural domains, and not to leave this as an afterthought. The use of this framework for me is to, as I said, to rethink uh, new economic models and to guide economic analysis more into scenario-based thinking. Furthermore, I like to see it being used to strive for integrated reporting by establishing connections with national accounting systems and policy instruments. I think otherwise a, uh, the new narrative or, or the new indicators that I propose will not be put to use in practice. At the level of central bureaus of statistics, there is already work going on to use satellite accounts in connection to the national accounts to experiment with including new economic agent categories and exchange flows. And I think that is a strategic entry point for engaging in, into this uh, discussion. And of course, the framework is a stepping stone to identifying and designing new economic indicators and economic performance measures that can ideally be used across policy domains that often operate in silos. Some last comments I'm going to make. The book also has implications for the way we teach economics. I'm in contact with several organizations that are also trying to connect to high schools and universities and starting up this discussion of rethinking economics and teaching it in a different manner. 
And I think it's very important to involve our students to, in uh, questions about the basic assumptions of economic concepts, theories and models, instead of only training them in designing better and more advanced models. This implies that we train more associative ways of thinking instead of linear thinking that, that has had a lot of prominence in the way economics was taught over the past 20, 30 years. And also to build interdisciplinary competences among econ economic students. And naturally, this leads to a broader set of quantitative and qualitative research methods and tools. In conclusion, I would like to say that, uh, yeah, uh, I hope it's clear by now that economics needs a new discourse, analytical framework and methodology. And I think one cannot go without the other. There are many different proposals out there, often arguing in favor of a new index, but I think it will not be put to use if it's not supported by a new discourse and connected to a new framework. Well-being economics tries to offer this robust framework and it helps planners, people in research and policy makers to make multidimensional trade-offs more transparent. And the WAM allows for ex ante economic analysis of inequality, environmental sustainability issues, which are the pressing issues of today. And the new methods and indicators should strive for more integrated reporting with national accounting systems and policy. Because if that is not the case, then people who are engaged in their professions with economic planning and giving input to policymakers, they will not see the use of it if it's based on data and figures that have no links to their own systems and methods of work. So thank you for your attention. And I'd like to give the floor back to Rowena now. Thank you very much. Thank you for summarizing an entire book in less than 20 minutes, which I think is quite a challenge we all appreciate. You certainly have made it very clear that a new discourse is needed. And I look forward to the questions when we, we hear if we have agreement from those in the audience. But before we do that, I would like to welcome Dr. Haddington Adame, who is going to talk for about 10 minutes and just give us some examples. We'd like to hear very much from, from Kenya and the learnings from COVID-19, which has highlighted a, a real need to think of wellbeing economics. So over to you, Dr. Adame. Thank you very much, Rowena. Thank you, Dr. Niki Pao, and thanks uh, Iadi for the opportunity to be a discussant to Dr. Niki Pao's book, which is um, a very well written book and very timely. The timing of this book is apt, and also the assertion that economics is at crossroads in terms of uh, addressing shocks. There are many shocks. Two examples stand out, the 2007-2008 financial crisis and the current COVID pandemic. Back home in Kenya, we have had the um, shocks like uh, floods and droughts. And also last year, we had uh, invasion of locusts and surely economics and economic models that we have cannot be able to address those shocks. As Dr. Nikki Powell says, addressing some of these shocks requires sort of integrated uh, perspective with an open eye to complex interactions and associative ways of thinking and analyzing these issues. The book is well anchored into global powerful propositions, which he has articulated, like so social solidarity, environmental sustainability, and limits to growth. 
Just talking about a little bit about uh, limits to growth, even before COVID-19 in Kenya, the growth economy we are told is growing at about 5.6% GDP, real GDP. But uh, last year it was very difficult time. People are saying money is not flowing into their pockets and the indications were massive layoffs People could not afford food. People could not travel home for Christmas holidays, which they do. So indeed, there are challenges that this book proposes to address. The book, of course, goes back to the concepts of three principles of economics, and Dr. Tapao has already articulated that. And she has emphasized that it is not just a, crit a critique of economics, but engaging with the building blocks of economics. And that is uh, like being a critical friend addressing those issues. The book also emphasizes on robustness of uh, the well being uh, economic model and does not shy away uh, to include a more nuanced approach to this model. What economists we call the, no the model is noisy. She's not afraid to engage and nuance that noisiness in the model by making and addressing the complex issues. The book also embraces the complexity of the well being, and she has articulated all those issues related to the resources, optimizing well being, complexity, and the economic agency. Addressing these issues, as she has already indicated, of a complex nature requires that openness, interactive approach, and integrative perspective. And for me, that's where lies the challenge and also opportunities. I would just like to mention that uh, addressing the, co the COVID-19, the coronavirus pandemic, uh, is a good example of how complex and the, this type of understanding and addressing these global as well as uh, national regional issues. In the short months since coronavirus came in in March, we have learned a lot about health than we have learned about health in the last 50 years. And we shall continue learning because learning is an important thing. And we learn from our mistakes, but also mistakes of others. And uh, as uh, Leonor, um, Eleanor Roosevelt said, learn from mistakes of others because you cannot live long enough to make your own mistakes. And the COVID-19 crisis exposes frailties not only in the health sector, but also in the economy around the world. The one lesson we have learned about this is that the pandemic in the countries which had uh, frail health systems suffered more than those who had a sound health systems. The chapter on the micro dimensions of well-being to me is really, really important because it does not only deal with those material things, uh, relational things, but also subjective things, but the interaction of those domains, but also in terms of decision making, which often is led or influenced by uh, trade-offs. I just want to take an example again of COVID and look at Taiwan. Taiwan has a population of 24 million people. That's uh, the census of 2018. And uh, had only 543 COVID-19 cases. Out of those 495 survived or uh, uh, recovered, and only seven deaths were reported. How did that happen? The country was able to achieve that for a number of things. One, 
cooperation of citizens. Very high cooperation, which relates to relationships, and especially in response to hygiene, which everybody's doing, washing hands, using masks, and social distancing. But also leadership, which falls within the domain of our politics but also inclusive health policies. Now, what we are learning from the Taiwan case is that if the system is fair and inclusive and that leadership is responsive, the citizens are likely to respond because they see benefits. Are there lessons from Kenya? Yes, there are. The course Kenya tends to have a class health system, very unequal system. And it calls for having a fair and inclusive health care system. Even with our meager resources, we can be able to achieve that. COVID has shown us and kind of educated us that if you have a sustainable health care system that prioritizes public health, then you can even overcome opportunistic diseases in the family. And in Kenya, we have noticed that the coughs, the stomachs and stomach aches and stuff have reduced families are reporting decrease in those uh, diseases because people are washing hands and applying masks and keeping distance. But also, in mitigating this uh, COVID, you also create employment of opportunities for the youth. Since March this year, a number of innovations have come up in the country than we have seen for the last 20 years. People were able to make masks locally. They were able to make uh, sanitizers. There are some even make uh, PPPs. Some even, some students even went ahead and made the ventilators. And this creation and inno innovation are things that we need to put forward. The other issue is that COVID, the positive side of it, although we don't encourage it to be there forever, is that it was very equalizing. As I said earlier, Kenya is an equal society. And people, when they fall sick, they usually jump onto their flight and fly to Europe or America to get treatment, those who can afford it. And they leave the local health care for the people who are poor. But this time with the COVID, they couldn't fly. They all stayed home and attended the same hostels that we attend. So the question is here. To what it, we have learned that uh, paying attention to people and the people's well being is critical. But how do we then be able to gain traction of these issues and be able to move forward so that, that the well being approach can be in, entrenched into our thinking? And just can you, I, you ask me for a reminder on the timing? So I'm just yes. going to give you your reminder now. Yes, thank you very much. The message here is how can we be able to use all methods, the discourse, the frameworks of available opportunities offered by, you know, WEM to be able to entrench the things which are happening today. And in terms of um, the methodological implications of this framework. It is very important to note that the timing is critical, but at the same time, we have to be aware that there are entrenched interests, especially at the national level, that people like to do things that they have done for a very long time and they may resist. Secondly, in a devolved government like Kenya and many others in Africa and elsewhere in the world, there are emerging opportunities for local level initiatives to pursue alternative de development path. So I would like to think that WEM has a potential 
to address some of this. I'm thinking of one county in Kenya called Makueni, where the governor has championed alternative development pathway. And this would be very useful. But there are challenges in terms of capacity uh, in data collection, capacity in uh, planning, capacity in uh, turning results into action, and also linking upwards. So this would be a useful opportunity for us to think about. I would like to thank uh, Rowena for this opportunity and as we move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and sorry to have to give you your warning there, but I can see lots of questions coming up and what we're going to do is try and get through as many as we can, but Nikki has kindly offered, she, we will look at what we haven't answered and we did this for her earlier webinar and she was very kind as to answer or to provide links for further information. So Nikki, while I'm grouping these together, I'm going to start with hopefully a broad comment for you. Hannington also touched on this, we talked about growth. So let's, I'd like to hear your views. Is economic growth really necessary to keep the economy moving forward? Should we be looking at degrowth? Or do we need to simply move beyond measuring growth altogether? If you would like to comment on that to start with, Nikki. Thank you, Lorena. And uh, thank you, Hannington, for a very valuable comments. I'm sure we will uh, come back to it in the, in the further discussion, but you raise very important points indeed. The question on whether growth is necessary or not, or, or should we pursue degrowth, is, is a very big question. I like to see it this way. I think that growth, a different type of growth, is, is needed. I think it will always be pursued in a capitalist uh, system. But at the same time, we should also explore degrowth routes. And let me explain why. One, I think that we, and Hennington also alluded to that in his comments, I think by rethinking the economy, we should pay much more attention to the conditions under which growth is generated. So the quality of growth, the social conditions and the environmental conditions. And then whether the, the economy then grows 1% or 10%, I don't think the discussion should be very much about that, but much more about the conditions under which growth is being generated. Second, I also see it as very fruitful to pursue pathways of degrowth, meaning that have consumption and production quantities are being reduced. But also there, I think it's, it's very much about have production and consumption quality under which conditions is, is this taking place. I think that is even more important than pursuing degrowth per se. And also, I think it's, it is very difficult in a capitalist economy to go without growth. Growth also generates resources that can be used to invest new in the economy and in transforming the economy and to provide for public goods and services. So I hope that answers the question. Great, thank you. Okay, we have a couple of questions sent in together. You can either separate them or answer them together. So we'd like to hear a bit more from you about how you address the traditional disconnection between macroeconomic implications and microeconomic implications, mostly when it comes to well-being. And following up from that, could you touch on the role of institutions, formal and informal, in understanding economic performance? Yes, thank you. That's again a very big question and I also would like to invite others to uh, share their views on this. It is true that economics is known to have troublesome relationship with the connection between macro and micro. And uh, traditionally, this is solved by what is called methodological in individualism, meaning that welfare that is generated at the micro level is simply added up, leading to social or, or national welfare in a very summative way. And this is only possible 
because the units that count into this uh, methodology are all quantitative and, and then traditionally what get measured is consumption levels, for example. Well-being makes that much more complex because well-being cannot be summated in the same way because it is multidimensional. But I do think that there can be connections between micro and macro, but there will also be differences. And I think we should allow for those differences. I think it is possible, and we are at the moment discussing this very point with the municipality of Amsterdam, who want us to design a well-being index for the city of Amsterdam, but are also talking about different levels, not so much national and, and urban, but within urban, at the metropolitan region, the municipality region and neighborhood level. So there, there again, we are talking about this multi-level uh, problem. And I think what we are finding uh, so far is that it is very well possible to identify certain aspects of well-being that are both relevant at the metropolitan region level and at neighborhood level. And I can imagine the same is true at national and micro level. And those data and indicators are already there, uh, for example, in terms of stability of income or uh, some inequality measures or some sustainability measures in terms of CO2 emission. But at the same time, in terms of setting priorities where the subjective element comes in, I think here we should allow for variation because, for example, in Amsterdam, there are quite some differences between neighborhoods in terms of physical environment, in terms of well-being, in terms of people managing to cope with COVID-19, for example, at the moment. And this leads to different priority settings. And I think if we use a dashboard of well-being indicators instead of one uh, composite index that hides those differences, I would find that more useful to look at uh, well-being in, in, uh, at multiple levels of analysis. So with Amsterdam, we have agreed to go for the design of a dashboard of well-being indicators which uh, has connections between macro and micro, but also some differences. And this is where, coming to the part of the question about institutions, this is where both formal and informal institutions come in. The formal institutions are very important for data generation and data use. And even between formal institutions at multiple levels of governance, there is difference in the kind of data that they collect and that they have access to even. And in terms of informal institutions, they play a hugely important role in making this process of identifying priorities at different levels a democratic and participatory process. So in Amsterdam, we work with neighborhood committees where we are going to discuss with uh, citizens what they deem important to improve in their neighborhood in the coming year as a form of uh, participatory priority setting in terms of well-being. I hope that answers the questions, but there's a lot more to say about it. And maybe Hennington also wants to comment. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, you have uh, answered the question very well. I also mentioned this issue in my presentation, and I think you have responded that uh, sometimes the uh, macro measures indicators of, of whether welfare or, and in this context, uh, well-being, don't uh, sit very well at the micro level, at the community level. And uh, they would like their own uh, way of doing things and uh, generating a, a system that works for them. And this is where I think the WEM, the framework that we're proposing needs to be sort of grounded. And I think you're already doing that. 
at the city of Amsterdam. I think this is uh, really crucial. In our own work, we have realized that there are three, three particular elements that are critical, uh, that uh, communities can be able to generate information and particularly using indigenous knowledge and may, you know, uh, kind of blending it with planning or modern knowledge for their benefit. We're also in circular and uh, solidarity economy uh, where people focus on uh, local resources, local production systems and benefits. Uh, this becomes really, really critical and organizing themselves in a form that can benefit from these processes is, uh, is very useful. Thank you. Great, thank you both. I just want to pick up, Nikki, you talked about Amsterdam there, and I know there's a lot of people here very interested in, in that example. So we have a question specifically around the policy implications. Does the matrix help to inform what kind of policies can contribute to achieving the indicators in the index? Yes, I mean, the book doesn't make specific policy proposals, but what it does, it a few steps back indeed to offer guidance to economic planners and modelers on how to inform policy in the end better by making the trade-offs between the different domains and different aspects of well-being uh, visible as part of economic analysis. Because you can imagine that when a framework does not account for nature, it does not account for the importance of social relationships or uh, community cohesion or local resources being used, used and production uh, contributing to local benefits, then it's very difficult and becomes more difficult to make a claim uh, for that to be important to be taken up by policy because then it becomes an afterthought and not a point that is taken into account from the start. So the framework does not give policy advices as such, but it provides a coherent framework in which this conversation is possible. And in a way that uh, that is integrated, as Hennington uh, remarked, but also in a way that to economists, impacts on the environment are no longer seen as a second order effect, for example, but as a first order effect, because it is now part of the basic framework. And I think that is the idea of the framework. It's not a, a model as such, it is a thinking guide. And on the basis of that, I would propose further operationalization in terms of new models, in terms of pluralistic use of models and in terms of a more modest use of models and move more towards scenario-based thinking that uh, compares and contrasts different pathways and taking into account the occurrence of uh, different risks and events that can happen and offset the stability of a system. Great, thank you. Towards the end of your presentation, you, you talked about the implications for teaching. So thinking about the training and the formation of economists, would you agree that one implication of the reconnection of, a, of economics with society and the natural world is that it can no longer be seen as a science in positive terms and that it will have to engage with processes that can't be fully measured and when there's no possibility of a single correct answer? I fully agree with that statement um, and I mean economics itself at faculties of uh, universities moved to trends. When I studied economics long time ago, <laughs> I remember that it was much more engaged with political economy questions, with social economic issues and also to a certain extent with the use of qualitative methodology. Uh, fair, a very famous uh, qualitative analysis in, in economics had the, the article on uh, 
The market of lemons is very important. The work of Piketty is it's descriptive analysis, but not so much quantitative. So it shows the importance of doing qualitative analysis and also building further on the work of anthropologists and other social scientists to reach to better concepts, to asking more critical questions and to, uh, as I said, a more modest use of quantitative analysis and not always aim for predicting one point estimates of eh, growth in the next year, but to much more uh, talk about and think about the process in itself, you know, where do we want to go and why do we want to go there and who is being, who is benefiting from that and who is not and under which conditions do follow that pathway. I think that's much more important. So I fully agree with that statement. I don't know who made it, but yes. <laughs> I've got a couple more questions. I'll try and get through to you before I ask you both for clo closing remarks. Nikki, you may have touched on this when you talked about modeling, but the question is, could you tell us a little bit about how the new framework considers the differences between the basic needs of humanity and how we allocate other resources that go beyond basic needs, but still lie within ecological boundaries? Mm. That's a very important question, and it reminds me of the work of Kate Rayward, that in, who indeed talks about this head social floor as a minimum of basic needs that an economy should provide for, for everyone, and making the e economy more inclusive. I think by the framework differentiating between between individuals and households, knowing that within households inequalities can also prevail in terms of accessing basic needs is important. And also the framework also looks at, uh, for example, community rules and customs and, and beliefs that, that also have something to say about how resources are allocated and so indirectly it does, but it doesn't take a political position on that. But the framework does allow to look at uh, these kind of uh, intra-community and intra-group or intra-household inequalities. And I think the step towards making a plea for providing uh, for basic needs for all is then much easier to make. Thank you. Uh, and now a question that you both might want to answer, and I think it's our final question for, for today. I think that you have convinced the people here today that of the need to rethink economics, but of course it's not just up to us. There are many other actors that uh, influence economics, for example, the private sector. So if you have any suggestions, what could be done to convince the private sector and other agents like that to adjust, operate, to fit a well-being economics model? Well, a simple but also not easy answer to that would be to, um, to do a lot of lobbying and engage a lot in conversations with them. But not only with the private sector, I think there are multiple institutions and actors out there that we need to engage with. And some of them come by themselves with questions. And for example, the Amsterdam municipality came to us. We did not come to them because also among economic professionals, whether they are in business or, or in government or in NGOs, they also have ideas on alternative uh, visions and they are also aware of uh, growing inequality or the need to for circular economy so we cannot assume this to be a you know a, a homogeneous group of of actors that do not want to uh, rethink the economy so i think it's important to identify those actors those individuals that have an interest in these ideas and that maybe are also trying themselves to change organizations from within. They are certainly out there. 
and then to link up and strategize. Uh, but it, it's not going to be easy, but I think it's not uh, hopeless. And uh, there's certainly also demands from the pro private sector and interest to do uh, di business differently. I mean, uh, we, we have talked for, for many years about corporate social responsibility, about social entrepreneurship, and I think there are many entry points uh, possible there. I don't know what your view on this uh, is, uh, Hennington. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, it is, is is a critical issue for me because the change in policy and the change in practice are critical for changing the way we do things in economics and beyond. So my my feeling is that uh, the starting point of uh, academia is critical. But again, as you said, recognizing other champions, we think of policymakers, politicians, we think of media playing a very important role. And I saw you already wrote a blog and it has already been taken up by the media. Champions in the process become very critical. We think of uh, policy uptake going upwards, but we also think of downwards, like what you're doing in the city of Amsterdam. And we also think of side, side tech, uh, where we involve NGOs and the media particularly to generate dialogue and engagement at different levels and with different stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you very much. Where our time is up, so I wondered if you have any closing remarks. Nikki, I have put the link to the book and also uh, the discount code in the chat. And also if you want to tell people about the Reading Club as well. Yeah, maybe as a closing remark, I would like to thank Dr. Hennington Adame for his very fruitful comments and reflections and Rowena for facilitating this and all the participants, of course, for being here today. I would like to invite those who would like to think further about the book and about the ideas in the book to join a reading club to start on 4th of November 2020. We come together via Zoom every two weeks for one hour, and you can sign up by just dropping me an email. You're most welcome. Thank you very much. It was very inspiring. So I would like to wrap it up there. Um, thank everyone for coming. Thank you, of course, Nikki, for condensing all of that. It's probably a lifetime of work into such a short amount of time. For Hannington, for bringing all of your diverse experience and squeezing it into even a shorter amount of time. We do have a couple of questions we didn't get round to, so I will check in with you both if we will send out answers and people are interested in the presentation as well. I'd like to thank everyone for coming and we will email you a recording of today so you can share with others. Also, we have an event on the 11th of November in a couple of weeks with Professor Joyita Gupta, which is on inclusive development. So it follows on very nicely from this themes about how we cannot just look at sustainable development to be really sustainable. We need to look at our kind of planetary boundaries. So I'd love to see some more of you there. And thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.